Welcome to uh, this rendition of the Beekner Institute program. It's good to see you on this National Fessner Day. Anybody know what National Fessner Day is? I'm told it's a day celebrated by psychophysicists. Now I know some psychophysicists. Is Ray here? It's also, uh, yesterday was actually uh, International Day of the Nacho and the anniversary of Thomas Edison's first successful attempt at the electric light. So there's no need for eating nachos in the dark, but it's a bad joke. <laughs> our, uh, our next gathering will be a special one. The student lecture for this semester with Miss Elizabeth Ferguson will be on November 5th at the usual time. be here for that. And now to today's program. Over the years of my career, I have taken an enormous joy in discovering new authors and new books. I have no doubt foisted one or more of them on several of you and brought several of those authors to campus over the last five or six years. That's because I have long believed with Ezra Pound that a book is a, is a fire you hold in your hand. I still believe that books can take us to important places, lead us down important roads. Anyone who says they have only one life to live must never have discovered books. Frederick Buechner, in his book, Eyes of the Heart, introduces the reader to his library which, as many of you know, he calls the Magic Kingdom. And he talks about walking into the library one day and realizing that all the books are silent. I want you just to hear a couple sentences. Shakespeare's not saying anything at all. Neither is L. Frank Baum. The Buddha, Dostoevsky, and Paul Tillich are all holding their tongues. Not a peep out of Abraham Lincoln or Emily Dickinson. Even Walt Whitman and the prophet Jeremiah are for the moment speechless. The air of the magic kingdom is electric with the silence they are keeping. What would I have been if I had never heard them break it? What would I have failed to see if they had not pointed it out to me? And what would I have never heard without their ears to hear it through? What would I have missed loving without them to show me its loveliness? What marvelous jokes would have been lost on me? What tears would I have never found the heart to shed? Such an idea of books, the power of books, is, I hope, familiar to many of you. Maybe you can still remember the night when you completely lost track of what time it was because you were so caught up in a book. Maybe you can remember the book that you never wanted to finish because it would be like saying goodbye to a friend. Last year, I met three such books. It was a good year. <laughs> Tobias Wolf's Old School, William Maxwell's So Long, See You Tomorrow, and Doug Wargle's Thin Blue Smoke. Since this is not ESPN, I don't have to rank them in any order. <laughs> I was speaking at a conference a man came up to me and told me, based on what he heard me just say, that I would like this book, Thin Blue Smoke. I came back, tracked it down. He told me it was about baseball, barbecue, and Beekner, And he was right about my liking the novel. I liked it so much, I started making phone calls to Kansas City to try to track down the author. And long story short, there he is. <laughs> I can always tell about my encounter with a book by leaping back through the pages to see where my pen came down. And Ellie, that's harder with Kindle. I, I uh, the circled page numbers, the, uh, the stars, the check marks, the brackets are all part of the record of how the book burned for me. And looking back, I realized that Doug had me on page 102. Many of you who have read the book know the story of the turtle. Laverne, the main character, has stopped his truck on the road to pick up a turtle and carry it to the side of the road. 
And his friend A.B. has begun to quiz him about what that was all about. And Laverne refers back to his uncle Delbert, from, her, from whom he learned this moving of turtles. I'm going to read you just a few sentences. Delbert is speaking to Laverne. You never know what the result will be from something you do. You see a turtle in the road and you worry it'll get killed, so you pick it up and you move it off to the side of the road and you think you've done something good. You probably did. But maybe that turtle was on its way home. And when you put it down on the other side of the road, it got mixed up in its direction and got lost and never did find its way back home. Or maybe the turtle actually makes it across the road, but then a fox sees it and eats it. So if you get the turtle out of the road, you're not saving it from the car running over it, but from the fox. But then maybe the fox goes hungry. Or maybe if you don't rescue that turtle, somebody driving down the road sees it up ahead, slams on the bricks, slides off the road, and gets killed. You just never know when you do something what will come of it. So you always just have to do the best you can. We are pleased to welcome to King College the man who could write that paragraph. He comes to the Beacon Institute today, a, a native of West Michigan, a longtime resident of Kalamazoo and Battle Creek and Lansing and places like that. He attended Gordon College in Massachusetts, has two degrees from Western Michigan University. Among his several professional experiences is a stint as book features editor for the Kansas City Star, and he was also editor for a time of Kansas City Magazine. His 2001 book, The Grand Barbecue, has garnered him fame as a national expert on barbecue and landed him a couple of times on the <coughs> channel. He promises to be brief this morning so we can all get out to Ridgewood before uh, too long. Finn Bushma, first published in the UK by Macmillan in 2009, has recently been republished in the United States, this edition by Burnside Books. The publisher of Burnside Books, Caleb Sealing, is right here on the front row this morning, one of our board members. Uh, and also, beside him, another of our National Advisory Board members, Jeff Monroe from Michigan. If you have really good things you want to say about the Beacon Institute, this would be a good time to come down and talk to them. If you have bad things to say, I'll get back to you later. Um, I'm sure I foisted this book on the two of them. By the way, Thin Blue Smoke is, I think, available, will be available in the back uh, in this brand spanking new, very nice edition. Having lived in Kansas City since 1989, Doug Morgel is the Director of Marketing for <coughs> Oklahoma Joe's Barbecue, one of the 13 places you're supposed to eat before you die. Please welcome to King College and Beaker Institute, Doug Morgel. to see and be seen were most easily achieved. But that day, something clicked inside Levi. He found himself repeatedly looking over at his classmate in the corner. He didn't like seeing the boy eating all by himself. There was something not right about him. Levi called over to the boy and invited him to come and sit at his table. The boy shook his head and looked away. Levi called to him again. Come on, he said. 
Come eat with us. If we don't fill this table up with boys, some gross girls might sit here. And Levi made a face indicating that he might vomit if a classmate of the female persuasion were to pull up a chair and take a seat. The boy avoided eye contact and pretended not to hear. Levi's friends were quiet and vigilant. Unsure of where this was coming from and where it was headed. But Levi would not let it be. He stood up, picked up his tray, and without the slightest shade of self-consciousness, went over and sat next to the other boy. Levi's bewildered friends followed along. Hope you don't mind, Levi said, but we weren't having any fun over there by ourselves. We thought it'd be more fun over here with you. Besides, like I said, we were worried about a girl invasion. The other boy smiled and nodded. And they all ate their sandwiches, potato chips, and apple slices. And that was that. End of story. <coughs> Except that everything is different now. Levi's friends are changed. They participated in a rare act of school lunchroom kindness from which they may never recover. The boy they befriended is changed. Lacking social grace himself, grace was extended to him. And my daughter Holla was changed by what she witnessed and by telling the story of it to me and to her family and to others. And I was reminded again that it is in telling and retelling stories of grace and kindness that we come to understand their redemptive power, that stories themselves have the power to change and to save. That's the story as I wrote it a couple of years ago. It's a story that has stuck with me. I've wondered since then what it was exactly that inspired or disturbed Levi enough to act. Would he have responded with such kindness and compassion if he'd seen his classmate alone on the playground or walking by himself in the hall or to or from school? Somehow I think not. I think a person eating alone is more alone, more lonely than a person doing other things alone. A person alone in their car is going somewhere, that's all. Persons walking by themselves are exercising. Good for them. People reading books or watching television alone are relaxing. Lucky them. But people who are eating alone are just sad. They're the alonest of alone. That's because eating, I believe, is meant to be done together with other people, not alone. I believe that's how God made us. And I think Levi just couldn't abide the idea of his classmate eating all by himself. Food and eating are what I came here to talk to you about today. Have you seen the television commercials for the Red Lobster restaurant chain where the chefs and waiters who work there tell us that they see food differently? My hope is that after our time together today, that you will see food differently. The Beekner Institute invited me here to convocate with you primarily because I've written a novel, Thin Blue Smoke, that contemplates themes that the readers of Frederick Beekner's uh, writing will recognize. Love and loss, despair and hope, squandered gifts and redemption, fathers and sons, the unfaithful solace of good whiskey, and the unfathomable silence of a God that we hope is a good God, though often we have our doubts. Beekner visits and revisits themes such as these because these are the themes of our lives, yours and mine. There are, however, themes present in my writing that do not appear much in Fred's work. For example, barbecue. Beekner's largely silent on the subject of barbecue. <laughs> as are Philip Yancey and Phyllis Tickle and Kathleen Norris, it appears it's been left up to me to fill the gap in the canon of Christian literature left by the, the, their neglect of this all important. Uh, spiritual <laughs> Barbecue is a theme not just in my writing, but in my life. That's because I live in Kansas City, which, as everyone knows, is the barbecue capital of the world. Barbecue is a theme in the lives of all Kansas Cityans. I know that Tennessee has a rich barbecue tradition, especially over in Memphis. 
And both Virginia and North Carolina can legitimately claim to be the birthplace of American barbecue. So I know I'm among folks here today that, that know their barbecue. And they may dispute, all of you may dispute, uh, uh, Kansas City's boast to be the barbecue capital of the world. But while barbecue may not have been born in Kansas City, it was perfected there. <laughs> Here's how that happened. <laughs> European settlers who first came to this continent and landed in the Carolinas and in Virginia in the early 17th century brought pigs with them for food. The pigs were very hardy animals. Not only did they survive the difficult voyage to the New World, but they thrived once they got here. Hogs were easy to raise. They were just let loose to forage in the forests surrounding the colonial settlements, and they fattened up rather quickly and rather nicely. And when cooked slowly over hot coals, a technique that Europeans learned from uh, native tribes in the Carolinas and down into the Caribbean, the meat was not only delicious, but it didn't spoil quite as fast. There was a preservative quality in the smoke, it turns out. And later it was discovered that dousing the pig's meat with, uh, with vinegar while cooking it further enhanced this, this preservative effect. This cooking technique was later called barbecue. A word also borrowed from a Caribbean tribe. The native word was bara B-A-R-A-B-I-C-U, B -A -R -A -B -I -C -U, very close to barbecue. And the meaning of that original word, that root word, was sacred fire pit. Later, when kidnapped Africans were forcibly brought to this country as slaves, the work of making the barbecue fell largely to them. Over the decades, barbecue as a cooking technique became enormously popular in the American South, but never really spread uh, much north or west until after the Civil War. When freed slaves from Tennessee, the Carolinas, other parts of the Deep South, migrated to Kansas City to look for new work and to start new lives. White people from the South also came to Kansas City during that time. Kansas City was both a river town and a railroad town, and had become an increasingly important hub for shipping livestock and meat to other parts of the country. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Kansas City was second only to Chicago in the size and importance of its stockyards and railheads. These Southerners, both black and white, who came to Kansas City brought with them their barbecue knowledge and traditions. These traditions found a second home in Kansas City and have thrived there ever since. Barbecue is now an integral part of Kansas City's civic identity. There are about 100 barbecue establishments in the Kansas City metropolitan area, far more per capita than any other uh, metropolitan uh, area in the United States. And Kansas City is home to more barbecue contests than any other city. These competitions include the American Royal Barbecue, the biggest, baddest, most prestigious barbecue competition on the planet. Kansas Cityans are passionate about their barbecue and will engage almost anyone in a good-natured argument about which barbecue joints serve the best brisket, ribs, or sauce. Everyone has a favorite. My favorite is a little joint about three blocks from the Missouri state line on the Kansas side. It's my favorite because Jesus likes to go there for lunch. <laughs> the barbecue joint is located inside a gas station convenience store, which itself is located on the edge of a rather sketchy neighborhood at the corner of 47th Avenue and Mission Road. 47th Avenue being the county line which separates affluent, largely white Johnson County to the south from the more economically challenged, ethnically rich Wyandotte County to the north. The seedy shopping strip next door to the barbecue joint features a payday lender, two thrift shops, and a liquor store. About a mile east is the Country Club Plaza, Kansas City, Missouri's most exclusive and she-she shopping and dining district. <coughs> it features white glove, parking valets, and horse-drawn carriage rides. I know that Jesus is a regular at this barbecue joint because I work there. I've seen him there. The name of the place is Oklahoma Joe's. I handle their marketing and advertising. It's my day job. Most writers need a day job. And as day jobs go, mine is about as good as they get. When I arrive at work in the morning, I'm greeted by the aroma of beef and pork and sausage, cooking slowly over the smoke of a hardwood fire. That never gets old. 
And as I spend my days, I spend them among the most happy, satisfied people in Kansas City, Oklahoma Joe's customers. There are only 77 seats in the place, and our barbecue is crazy popular. So our customers have come to expect that they will likely have to wait in line for their food, sometimes as long as an hour. The thing is, they don't seem to mind standing in line. They embrace it as part of the Oklahoma Joe's experience. They, while they wait in line, they take pictures of themselves with their smartphones and post them to Facebook or tweet them to their friends. They joke and laugh with one another and strike up conversations with the folks in line ahead of them or behind them. And sometimes they'll go up to the counter and buy a beer and drink it while they stand in line. The people in line at Oklahoma Joe's define any market researcher's attempt to categorize, analyze, stratify, or demographify. On any given day, you might see a group of orange-vested construction workers in line next to a pair of doctors in their pale green scrubs, next to a retired couple in matching t-shirts who arrived from Minnesota in their RV, next to a consultant from Boston in a $5,000 bespoke suit who arrived from the airport in a limousine, next to a trio of pierced and inked bourbon Asian skaters, next to a couple of African-American yuppie suburbanites, next to a bunch of heavy-set, middle-aged white guys in town for a heating, ventilation, and air-conditioning convention. <laughs> their name badges dangling from lanyards around their necks. You get the picture. When these folks finally get to the counter to place their order, somehow, no matter how crowded the dining room is, there always seems to be a table ready. We play the blues on the sound system at Oklahoma Joe's, yet in the dining room, under Wailing guitar solos by B.B. or Stevie Ray, you can hear a constant low murmur of contentment as people eat their smoked brisket, pulled pork, ribs, and sausage. Everybody smiles. Nobody complains. Politics, theology, status, and money are of no importance here. Everyone agrees this is the best barbecue they've ever eaten. And there, among them, in their midst, is Jesus. I've heard for Folks uh, call him by name there. They'll, they'll bite into a rib and then they'll close their eyes and say, Sweet Jesus, this is good. <laughs> and sometimes when I'm out of my way, I'm out, on my way out of the dining room, I'll see customers bow their heads in prayer before they eat, before they eat. And I know Jesus is there too because he said he would be. My father was an African, uh, was an American Baptist uh, minister. When I was growing up, my dad would insist that we pray before meals, even when our family was eating out at a restaurant. He still insists on this practice today. I was not as rebellious as some preacher's kids are, but I did resist praying in public, especially at restaurants. It was, for me, an awkward and self-conscious act. I felt people at the other tables staring at me as I bowed my head. And my father, being a seminary-trained preacher, tended to structure his prayers like a three-point sermon. Citing specific scripture to substantiate his primary thesis with plenty of personal anecdotes included for illustration. Prayers went on forever. <laughs> Not only was our food cold by the time we finished, but it started to smell bad. <laughs> My perspective has changed since then. I no longer resist, at least not quite so strongly. I've come to understand that when Jesus makes himself known to us, or rather, when we wake up to the fact that he is always with us, it is often when we are sitting down to eat, at the dinner table, or in the company break room, or even in a middle school cafeteria. And it's a good and natural thing to bow one's head to acknowledge him in those moments if one has the courage and the character to do so. My change of heart is due in part to my growing sense that on that Thursday night a long time ago, when Jesus was eating dinner with his friends for the last time in that upper room, when he took bread and wine and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this wine, remember me, he was not so much instituting a religious ritual he intended for us to perform in church on a weekly or monthly or quarterly basis, as much as he was saying, whenever you eat, think of me. In preparation for this lecture, I reread the gospel passages in which Jesus talks about food, or blesses food, or miraculously produces or multiplies food. There are dozens of such passages. They appear in nearly every chapter of the four gospels. After studying these passages, my first impulse was to 
conclude that Jesus had a unique relationship to food. But the most remarkable thing about Jesus' relationship to food was, or rather is, that it is not unique. It is, in fact, quite normal and entirely human. Food and eating are everywhere in the Gospel story because it is a story about God's relationship to humanity and humanity's relationship to God. And because we, humans, cannot exist without food, without eating, any story about us, humans, will naturally include food. Of course, the story, the Gospel stories are also a story about Jesus. God made flesh. God made man, human, human. And if any proof were ever needed of Jesus' humanity, Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, provides it. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus recognized, was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said unto them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they had seen a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. He showed them his hands and feet, but still they couldn't believe it. Finally, he asked them, You got anything to eat? Here's Jesus, newly resurrected, walking in on his grieving disciples, quite literally scaring the hell out of them, and as you would expect, they go nuts. They can't believe their eyes. Surely this must be a ghost. They scream in terror. And as always, Jesus must calm his excitable friends. Guys, it's me. Look, flesh and bone. I'm real. It's me, Jesus. And then, when they realize it's true, they go crazy all over again. And Jesus looks on, amused, affectionately annoyed. He lets them carry on for a while. And then finally he asks, hey, you got anything to eat? Theologians point to this passage as proof of Jesus' bodily resurrection as opposed to a merely spiritual or lesser yet symbolic resurrection. I like to point to it as proof that Jesus was hungry. <laughs> After all, he'd been to hell and back, which can be an exhausting trip. <laughs> My guess is that when he was in hell, no one served him dinner, so our guy was hungry. And it seems natural to me that upon being reunited with his friends, Jesus would want to eat with them. The last time they were together all in one place was in that upper room around the dinner table. Friends eat together. It's what they do. Again, it's part of what makes us human. <coughs> Think about it. How many of the most intimate and human moments of our lives are centered on or accompanied by food and the eating of it together? First dates, marriage proposals, wedding receptions, birthday parties, graduation parties, family reunions, anniversary celebration, and even, in the end, a wake. When Jesus said, as often as you do this, as often as you gather together to eat, remember me, I believe he was thinking of just these times. And is it not appropriate that our thoughts would turn to him on our first dates, when we propose marriage, at wedding receptions, birthday parties, graduation parties, family reunions, anniversary celebrations, and even in the end, wait. And not just those times, but when your baby takes her first bite of solid food, or when your loved one in a hospital bed tentatively takes a spoonful of jello after surgery, or when you bring a fresh baked pie to the new neighbors down the block, aren't those also times when we should remember Jesus? Harvard University researchers argue that it was the invention of cooking some 1.8 million years ago that sparked the evolution of the species of hominids that eventually became homo sapiens, <coughs> modern humans. In his book, Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human, the anthropologist Richard Rangham says that when early hominids learned to control fire and cook food, their brains began to grow and their interactions with one another became more social, more human. 
He says, cooking is the signature feature of the human diet and indeed of all human life. It is the development that underpins many other changes that have made humans so distinct from other species. The human brain requires a vast amount of energy, and cooking food makes it easier and faster to eat. It also allows the body to extract more calories from it and to use less energy in the consuming of it. Thus, as early hominids began to cook their food, over the generations their brains began to grow. And with larger brains came more sophisticated thinking, the use of tools, the development of agriculture, and the development of more complex social structures evolved as the human brain itself evolved. Wrangham believes that the advent of cooking was the impetus for evolution of uh, traditional male and female uh, roles in a family, and that it fundamentally reshaped human families and relationships, making the family and the family home central to human existence. <coughs> Gregory Layton of the University of Minnesota was one of Wrangham's co-researchers, and he says that before the hominids began cooking their food, they would have eaten whatever they found or killed right on the spot, wherever they happened to find it or kill it, kill it just as chimpanzees do. But cooking was a more labor-intensive uh, effort and required more people with specialized skills, and so it required that the food be brought to a central location where the fire could be started and the cooking tended to. It was a group effort, and thus it forged relationships within the group, relationships that extended beyond the campfire and the cooking circle. Layton asserts that the kind of individual and group uh, work required by cooking resulted in early humans forming more stable relationships between males and females, as well as larger family and social groups. Cooking required cooperation. Cooking transformed eating into a social function and transformed the species from hominid to human. Wrangham concludes, to this day, cooking continues in every known human society. We are biologically adapted to cook food. It's part of who we are and affects us in every way you can imagine, biologically, anatomically and socially. And I would add, it affects us spiritually. Perhaps I'm pushing my premise too far. Eating is, after all, only a simple biological function, the intake of fuel, which is converted into energy which our bodies require to live. But it is also a fundamental act of love. It is the fundamental act of love. A mother's first and most important job is to feed her child. Food is not a metaphor for our relationship to God, or rather, God's relationship to us. Food is God's relationship to us. He feeds us. And let me say again, I don't mean to say that he feeds us in a spiritual sense, though he does do that. I mean that he feeds us. Literally, he feeds us food because he loves us. He feeds his entire creation out of love. In the same way that love is not God, but God is love. Food is not God, but God is food. Food is not a metaphor in the gospel. It's not a symbol. It's a reality, as it is in human existence. Let's look at the gospel story of the loaves and fishes. First, let's remind ourselves that this isn't one of Jesus' parables. This is an actual event reported in all four gospel accounts. Jesus had gone off on a boat to be by himself after receiving word that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been executed. But a crowd of about 5,000 of his followers had learned of his whereabouts and had gathered on the shore nearby. But as the day dragged on, the crowd got restless, and Jesus' disciples got anxious. Folks were getting hungry. But instead of going home to eat, they were hanging around waiting for Jesus to come. It needs to be pointed out here that this was not a crowd of starving people waiting for Jesus to feed them. They were not there for food. They were there for Jesus. But when Jesus was told that the people who had come to see him were getting hungry, he felt sorry for them. He knew how it feels to be hungry. So he asked if anybody had any food on hand. And a boy came forward with a couple loaves of bread and some fish. You know the rest of the story. Something miraculous happened. What was the miracle of the loaves and fishes? Was it that Jesus used his divine power to multiply the food so that one child's simple lunch fed a crowd of 5,000? 
perhaps? Or was it when people in the crowd saw that the child was willing to share his lunch with Jesus, they were moved by a spirit of generosity to share the food that they had brought as well? And when everyone shared, everyone was fed. That's an interesting question for theologians to argue over. For me, however, the miracle is less interesting than the fact that Jesus chose to feed the crowd rather than send them home to feed themselves. Jesus engaged in the very human act of hospitality. By breaking bread with them, he put himself in relationship with them. And by sitting and eating with each other, the people gathered there today, that day put themselves in relationship with one another. At the beginning of the passage of the Gospel from Luke that I shared with you earlier is the end of the story of Jesus appearing to the two men who were walking from Jerusalem to the town of Emmaus. Jesus had been crucified dead and was buried just a few days earlier. And when the resurrected Jesus joined the men on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him. Funny how we often don't recognize what we don't expect to see. Anyway. The men arrive at their destination, and they've enjoyed Jesus' companionship so much that they ask him to stay and eat with them. And Jesus agrees. And when they sit to eat, Jesus takes some bread and breaks it and gives thanks, and that's when the two men recognize him. Jesus made himself known in the breaking of the bread. Jesus makes himself known whenever we break bread, if we pay attention, if we open our hearts to his presence. Remember the meaning of that native word, barbecue? It meant sacred butterfish. The indigenous people who coined this word understood that there is something sacred, something holy in the food that we eat, that it is a manifestation of our relationship with the divine. Food is not God, but God is food. Food is one of the primary ways God demonstrates his love towards us. He feeds us. And food is one of the primary ways we, humans, demonstrate our love toward one another. We feed one another. And when people are hungry in our midst, it is not evidence of God's lack of love. It is evidence of ours. Even on death row, as condemned prisoners prepare to die, in the final hours before their execution, they are offered a final meal. It is one last act of kindness, perhaps undeserved, but one last acknowledgement, nevertheless, of their humanity. Earlier this year, as I was leaving work at the end of the day, as I was walking through the restaurant, through the front door, as I usually do, coming into the restaurant were three women. One of the women, women was being helped by the other two. They held her and steadied her by her arms and were helping her forward. The woman's skin sagged and was a sickly, waxy hair. <coughs> what little hair left on her head was wispy and dull. There were great dark circles under her sunken yellow eyes. She was, I assume, very near death. The women helping her appeared to be her mother and her sister, and it appeared that this woman was coming to our little joint to enjoy some barbecue with, their, with her mother and sister one last time before she died. The presence of those three women that day sanctified our restaurant, making it a sacred, thinner place, a place where the membrane that separates here from the hereafter is thinner and more permeable. I believe Jesus was there that night at the table with those women. Just last month, I received a message on a restaurant's Facebook page from a man who told me that his mother had that week been sitting with her terminally ill husband as he lay dying in their home. And she asked her son if he would go get some Oklahoma Joe's barbecue and bring it home to her. He told me, she said that would be the most comforting thing I could do for her, he said. I believe Jesus went home that night with that good son when he brought our barbecue to his mother. These stories remind us how important food is beyond its function as a fuel source for our bodies. They're also another reminder of just how important barbecue is to Kansas Cityans. <laughs> Not even the specter of death can separate Kansas Cityans from their barbecue. <laughs> I was a writer and editor at the Kansas, for Kansas City's newspaper, the Kansas City Star, for more than 10 years. The Star published its first edition 132 years ago on September 18, 1880, and right smack dab in the middle of that very first edition of the Kansas City Star is an article with the headline, The Grand Barbecue. The article describes a huge community event celebrating the completion of a long-awaited and long-delayed rail connection. 
this news article uh, details a parade in the afternoon and then in the evening, a grand barbecue. The article ends with a sentence that is nearly biblical in its prose and its promise. It's a beautiful sentence that could be describing heaven, but is in fact describing Kansas City. It concludes with these words. Where a sumptuous feast of fat things is prepared for all that may come. A couple of weeks ago, one of Oklahoma Joe's regular customers emailed me a story. She said she'd been shopping at the grocery store across the street from our barbecue joint when she met a neighbor of hers in the store parking lot. Her neighbor was new to Kansas City, and as they stood and chatted in the parking lot, the neighbor looked across the street and inquired about the long line of people waiting outside the gas station. Is that a soup kitchen or something, she asked. I love that story. Because even though the people lined up outside our barbecue joint are not poor and hungry in the literal way that folks lined up at a soup kitchen are poor and hungry, they are poor and hungry in the spiritual way that all of us are poor and hungry in a spiritual way. And so they, we, line up waiting to be fed. And in sitting at a table together to eat, our spirits are fed. In the Episcopal tradition of which I am now a part, the center of the liturgy, the worship service, is not the beginning, but not the bringing of the word, but rather the breaking of the bread. After the scripture and the sermon have been delivered and our sins confessed, we rise and we move to the center and stand in line as one people waiting to be fed. We move forward together toward the altar, slowly, patiently. Communion is not the bread and the wine that we will receive once we reach and kneel at the altar. The communion is standing in line together, together with people you love and people you don't particularly like, with people you don't know and people you know too well, all waiting to be fed, all waiting to eat, like the folks in line at Oklahoma Joe's. It is Christ who made a sacrament of the simple and necessary and human act of eating. Whenever you do this, he said, remember me. Remember that I came among you and was and am human, and that I too was hungry and needed to eat, and was lonely and needed the fellowship of gathering around a table to share a meal. On many Sundays, when the priest invites our congregation forward to partake of the Eucharist, he or she will do so with these words. The table of bread and wine is now made ready. It is the table of company with Jesus and all who love him. It is the table of sharing with the poor of the world with whom Jesus identified himself. It is the table of communion with the earth in which Christ himself became incarnate. So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often and you who have not been here for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed, come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. A feast is prepared for all.